Gold is moving. Gold is moving. Well, you like that, eh? I've got a machine too, you putz. Two billion years ago, much of our planet was a volcanic inferno. But when the building was done and the glaciers had receded, there remained in central Canada two unique phenomena. The Great Lakes, with a third of the world's fresh water, and the Canadian Shield, the oldest rock on Earth, known already to contain so much of the world's minerals. But in one small corner of this vast landscape, near the north shore of Lake Superior, is a place called Hemlo, a name to remember. We're looking for a spot to get up the hill that wasn't too hard on snowshoes. In the next hour, you will meet some remarkable Canadians. This is Don McKinnon, a prospector. He was convinced a mother load of gold lay buried near Hemlo, waiting to be discovered, and set out to find it. I remember taking a look at the sharp cliff, and the trees were lo loaded with snow. We couldn't see it, and we had to go up the hill sideways. Starting from this point, within 100 meters of the Trans-Canada Highway, McKinnon staked 20,000 claims. His partner for part of the venture was John Larch. He and McKinnon had worked together back in the 60s. By chance, they met again in 1979 and decided on a partnership to exploit a key Hemlo property. Exhaustive research had convinced McKinnon that he was onto something big. He and Larch went to this man, David Bell, a geologist. Their findings fitted a different theory that Bell believed in about how gold was laid down in the beginning. But to test the theory would take a lot of money. Enter Murray Pezim. The girls don't kiss me, it's your fault, Sam. Yeah, I know. Pezim is perhaps the most colorful stock promoter in North America. If anyone could raise the millions needed, he could. Pezim felt good about the proposal and chose to back McKinnon and Larch all the way. The result was the Hemlo Gold Camp the biggest single gold find in North America ever. Walter Baker told me many years ago about the area he worked in in the 40s, and he had got pan all this gold. He pan in the creek and he pan the sand, the soils. Got gold in the soils. And every overturned rock ran. And he says it's worthwhile going back in there, but it, it was really what led me there. Walter Baker, still prospecting at 82, lives and breathes the business. I said, look, we have all kinds of, uh, uh, of high grade here to give the geologists. Uh, Baker had seen surface showings of gold around Hemlo back in the 40s. At one drilling site, he missed a main ore body by fewer than 100 meters. Fishermen are hard pressed to beat prospectors for hard luck stories. You know, even further work was done on the ground that Mr. Baker was on at the time. They had uh, in their geochem, done by a reputable firm, uh, they had 10,000 parts per million. That's an ounce of gold in the soils. But geez, if you got an ounce in the soil, you can pick up a handful of sand and you, 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 it's a good place to be looking. The only thing, I think it was scary because there was a power line there, a railway and a, and a highway. Well, it scared people away. Oh, scare people away, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's got to be in the Arctic. Or, <laughs> it's like the federal government. They, they map all the Arctic and uh, this is down here where the people are, they, no mapping done. I guess like, scientists like to be up north. McKinnon set about a systematic search of anything and anyone to do with Hemlo and the surrounding area. He went to libraries, looked at old records. For 15 years, he gathered information, studied satellite maps and surveys. He talked with prospectors and professors, checked staking records to see if and when they would come free. His search took him back before Confederation. I found uh, some articles that dated back to 1665, which actually was the voyage of Radisson and Groselier. From Groselier was a lay helper for the Huronia Jesuits, who in 1660 teamed up with brother-in-law Radisson to trade furs north of Lake Superior. Later, they were the organizers of the original Hudson's Bay Company. On this trip, they returned to France with amethyst and gold. There was a little gap in their map when they got the gold and the amethyst. I guess they didn't want anybody to know where they were. McKinnon had a good idea. The pieces in the puzzle were beginning to fall into place. He went into the bush alone to stake what is now the Golden Scepter claim. While in the area, he met Larch, 
and after a brief discussion, they decided to team up again and try and exploit some of the new finds together. Larch takes up the story. We staked uh, claims starting in 1979, then we added a bit on in early 1980, and then a larger group in the, in the summer of 1980. Finding a prospect is one thing, financing it is another. McKinnon and Larch went first to Toronto, a natural choice. But metal prices generally were in a slump, and although the gold price was strong, nobody shared their enthusiasm for Hemlo's potential. Many companies had worked the area before, particularly in the past 40 years, but always they had missed the main ore body. Too many geologists and mining company executives were convinced that Hemlo could not be the big one, but not McKinnon. While I've been in this business for so many years, there's times that I've taken our last cent or my last cent and put it in the claims and have pounded doors here in Toronto until you almost give up. 80,000 tons of 0.27, which was knowledge and available to everybody to look at. Logs and all. All the data was there. This is what was really frustrating to think that anybody could sit in their little throne in Toronto here and tell me that the potential was too small. Timmins is the birthplace of many great mining empires. First in 1910 was Hollinger. In its prime, the Hollinger mine was number two in the world, and the fortune it generated became a cornerstone of Argus Corporation. Dome mines began here also, as did McIntyre Porcupine in 1911. Naranda owns McIntyre. In the mid-60s, Timmins was the center of the Texas Gulf Rush, and now it shares in the excitement of Hemlo. It is here that Bell met with McKinnon and Larch. At that point, we, we, we presented what we had to uh, David Bell uh, for his opinion, and he liked it very, very much. Much gold is formed by volcanic activity. Why not Hemlo billions of years ago, thought Bell. In a modest office at the corner of Pine and Third, he outlines the theory that gave Hemlo a place in history. We have, a, say, a typical volcano shaped like this in an area and the main ejecta is coming off the top as it blows its top. It was much more violent than your average volcano. In reality, the gold is not generally uh, associated in that event, but uh, if, if you can think of this thing as being very deep-seated and very hot down here, you have fractures that come up on either side of the flanks of the volcano, and it's up in these little flanks that you get hot spring activity. And in this hot spring activity, the, the model that we conceive of this deposit being formed in uh, was based on uh, muds and brines that were being precipitated through the hot spring and coming out onto the surface and rolling down the slope, uh, forming beds. So in reality, on a small scale, this may be your hemlo discovery. McKinnon and Larch now were convinced more than ever of the value of their discovery and began to look elsewhere for money. Toronto had closed its doors. Next stop was Vancouver. We had several deals on it, but by the time the deal finally came, which was months later again, it ended up in uh, International Corona. Many junior mining and exploration companies have set up shop in Vancouver. They, and speculative money from all over the world, like the rules that the Vancouver Stock Exchange and the BC government have established. Corona was just such a junior company that day in 1980 when McKinnon came to call. Manager at the time was Nell Dragovin. The property was put into a, what was basically a little company called Corona that had drilled for oil in Manitoba and the wells had come up dry. And Murray organized the financing for this company. Um, it took, without Murray's say so, the brokers wouldn't have financed the deal. It was here in the offices of Murray Pesim that Act Two of the Hemlo story began. Yellow. Okay, fine. Right, buddy. Fine. Yep. Gold, sure. It's f <laughs> fly your assy mother. <laughs> Murray Pesim, the Pez, is a promoter. He is the man that McKinnon and company yeah, went to for money, high-risk well, money. McKinnon's data were impressive, but for a major success, they would have to define the extent of the main ore body. 
As McKinnon said, it was open at both ends, meaning they hadn't found any limit. But did it dip away? And to what depth? That depth would be critical also. A drilling program was the only way to test the theory of Hemlow's potential. 15 and 3 8, 17. All right, clean it out of 30, please. Stay a quarter bit. Bye. Do you think they'll ever take me alive? No. Nope. <laughs> nope. nope. <laughs> uh, I had great belief in David Bell and his theory. Uh, mind you, it was sending cost a lot of money and hurting a bit. Uh, certainly getting a lot of adverse comments, saying how crazy it was. The well, Hemlock was very tough. It, there was a year and a half of hard work. Before. Peter Brown. Chairman of the Board of Directors, Vancouver Stock Exchange. It was right in a heavily explored area of Ontario. You had every major saying, well, we've worked there before and there's nothing there. This is crazy. So when we were flying in the face of, ge of existing geological thought. It was a gamble, but a small group led by Pezim decided to go ahead. Bell had outlined a drilling program to map out the possible location of the ore body. Imagine a gigantic chessboard, and you decide to drill down every third square or every fourth square, hoping to bring up a core sample with commercial amounts of gold in it. If the sample looks good, you move on to the next square, and so on, gradually mapping an outline of where the ore body is. But remember, this is thousands of meters down in the earth. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Just a few meters one way or the other can make all the difference. But I, I think what really egged me on, I was taking such a bashing from the East, you know, their comments on it. That I, you know, I just got stubborn. I said, you know, I'll show those sons of guns. <laughs> you like that, don't you? <laughs> what this is all about. And, uh, no, but uh, I used to speak to David every day on the results. And uh, I truly believed, you know, I was ready to go for my whole bankroll. Simple as that. The gamble is how many test holes do you drill before packing up and walking away. It costs on average between one and three hundred dollars a meter to drill down, so it doesn't take long to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. The odds against finding anything are awesome, but Bell remained confident and Pezim kept paying. No, I was uh, quite confident in the uh, gold assays I was getting in the area that uh, uh, there was too much smoke to leave. I knew there was fire somewhere. Most companies would begin to get edgy after 10 holes, but whatever the reasons, Bell and Corona kept going. Uh, we were lucky enough to have a company that was uh, f uh, believed in the theory, had the finances. Uh, we just kept on plodding along. I know David had a hard time convincing me that that it was that there was something exciting and worthwhile there. I remember he told me that that what we had now was was very interesting. That I should be buying stock, and I went out and did that. And then when I finished, I'm, oh my God, what have I done? She need not have worried. They went 50 holes, then 70, and on the 76th, they found what they were looking for. They had gambled and won. Pinched myself a few times. <laughs> uh, I think even today I kind of uh, sit back and wonder if this is really happening. It's, uh, I think, the dream that uh, many professional people, as well as prospectors or investors, always think of being involved with. And uh, I can't even believe I'm sitting here today with you. <laughs> On Bell's home turf in Timmins, the news broke finally and the market reacted. Hemlo broke, I think, and really broke in the fall of 82, and it was, I guess you could call it pandemonium. People were um, rushing in who shouldn't have been rushing in to buy stocks that they shouldn't have been buying. Everyone, everyone wanted to get the next Corona or Goliath or Golden Scepter, and uh, certainly they were buying moose pasture right, right from here to the Alberta border. <laughs> In Vancouver, where it all began, the stock exchange went wild. Some stocks were doubling almost overnight. The key properties were Corona, Goliath, and Golden Scepter. Uh, 
uh, when it first hit, it was such a great plus for the market because everyone was in the doldrums. Gold was way down, and uh, there was no volume here. And all of a sudden, Hemlo comes along in a big strike, and gold prices seem to improve at the same time. And uh, we went from doing maybe five or six or ten million shares a day to 30, 25 million, like overnight. And everyone was uh, who was crying the blues two or three months earlier was uh, all of a sudden making money again. So it was fun. This is what the excitement was all about. These little specks of gold are true wealth. If there's enough for one quarter ounce of gold per ton of rock mined, you've got yourself a gold mine. We know now, drill indicated over 100 million tons, 25 million ounces of gold. That's a lot of gold. It's 12 and a half billion dollars there. Right now, at today's gold prices. Do you realize what that means for Canada? There were other players in the Hemlo drama. Before they met Pezin, McKinnon and Larch went door to door in Toronto looking for money to keep on staking. There were no takers. Two men approached were lawyer Rocco Shirali and promoter Claude Bonhomme. Bonhomme remembers the occasion so well. I had known uh, Don for a number of years and Mr. Larch for a number of years. And uh, they were down in Toronto at, uh, remember correct, I think it was 79. Uh, they were trying to deal the Corona property at that time. And I approached my good friend here, Mr. Shirelli, and Mr. Shirelli at that time did not feel that uh, it was uh, the opportune time to take an investment in the Emlo area. So I, I said to him, no, it was one of uh, the big mistakes that I've ever made. But uh, the damn thing was under the highway and uh, it was, uh, I think it was 50,000 tons or maybe 89,000 89, 89, yeah, 89, tons and uh, it was, the highway went over the top of it and uh, it had been looked at before and uh, I knew it wasn't worth $50,000. <laughs> so consequently, um, we weren't able to uh, complete a deal with Don on the corner property. He was able to complete a deal with someone else. Uh, thereafter, he uh, reapproached us again and suggested maybe we should be staking claims in the area because there seemed to be uh, activity being created by uh, Murray Peasant that had taken over the property that Don was, uh, was trying to deal to us. So at that time, I went back to my friend, Mr. Shirelli again, and suggested that we get involved in Hemlo. And Mr. Shirelli said, is it good? I said, yes, it's good. He said, okay. He says, let's take it. A modest investment made them both very wealthy men. Here's me discovering Corona. Well, we'll go right through. Here's me breaking ground for the shaft. First shovel, my lad. You notice? Who says I don't know how to handle a pick and a shovel? The first half of a year and a half to two years was all gut slugging. There was no joy. And I would think in that, that was Pesham's critical time. He was, that was where he persisted when nobody believed in it. Then when Miranda came and did the deal with Goliath and Golden Scepter, which was one of the richest deals a major in Canada is done with a junior at that stage. Then it got credibility, then it became easy, then everybody said, hey, we better take a look at this. But prior to that time, uh, nobody believed that Murray Pezum sitting in Vancouver had found Canada's most important gold camp sitting on the Trans-Canada Highway in the heart of the Toronto, Mi Ontario Mining District. They just couldn't face it. You can ship the gold from this camp and by Greyhound bus if you want to. By the middle of 1983, three main sites were being developed. International Corona, Lac Minerals of Toronto, and the Goliath Golden Scepter claims, now being developed by Noranda Mines and called Golden Giant. Noranda had bought into Hemlo as one of the few mining companies able to develop a property of this size. It meant sinking a main shaft to 1,400 meters and constructing crushing and refining facilities on site. Noranda had set an awesome pace, from first shovel to first gold brick in two years. Until then, an unheard of schedule. Construction crews worked around the clock to meet deadlines. There were delays finding enough gravel for all the concrete to be poured. And there was one ominous deadline to be faced, winter. Winter comes early and severe to this part of Canada, but Hemlo somehow seemed charmed. One of the, uh, one of the most fortunate things that it's find, as far as we're concerned, is its ideal location, almost an ideal location, where we're within uh, 
half a kilometer of the main hydro line going through the area. We have Trans Canada Highway on one side, an abundance of water. We're also very close to the main CP rail line. Uh, three towns and two Indian reservations from which to draw our, our working population. I don't know how many uh, how many people wish they'd taken a closer look while they were driving by on holidays or, or out walking around looking for blueberries or whatever. And perhaps even more important is the impact on the job market. There's lots of gold there, that's all I, and lots of jobs created, that's the main thing. Uh, it's a great feeling, uh, really, the, to see that, uh, you know, we're going to directly and directly to 8,000 more jobs in Ontario. Hemlock could prove different in another way, too. Most resource towns in Canada rely on one industry for their economic well-being and are vulnerable because of that. Nearby Hemlo is Marathon, with one quarter of its population working for the U.S.-owned James River Pulp Mill. Hemlo Gold will change all that. Already, the township has new home and industrial sites marked off. An 1,100-meter airstrip has been built, and if the early gold find is just a beginning, as many claim, then Marathon could become a distribution center for the entire gold field. Reeve William Springer. There is an excitement brewing in this town that uh, we haven't had probably in 40 years uh, in this particular area. I think it's uh, just a great uh, chance. It's, it's a real uh, interesting time to be involved in the municipal government and uh, in the life of a town because you're seeing a, a boom town develop and a, a new industry come in and uh, the entire life of the community is going to change. In 1979, when McKinnon and Larch began staking, most of the ground around Hemlo was available, except for 11 claims patented in the 40s by a southern Ontario doctor, J.K. Williams. In 1981, Lack Minerals made a shrewd deal with Williams's widow for the 11 claims, which together with other staking, gave them half the known reserves in the area by the end of 1983. There are three mines being developed at Hemlo initially. Tech Corporation on the Corona property, Naranda on Golden Giant, and Black Minerals. One problem facing all three is what estimated reserves to use when planning crushing and refining facilities. In one year, proven reserves have tripled, and further drilling confirms more ore. LAC President and Peter Allen. The total ore body uh, should be able to be produced around six or 8,000 tons a day. That would be all companies, as we know right now. Um, in terms of Canada's production, um, we're looking, I think the total ore body could produce in excess of 500,000 ounces a year, perhaps 600,000 ounces a year. And uh, that would be about a third of Canada's production currently. It could boost Canada's output to 100 tons a year. Naranda is first to commit to a complete mining and milling operation on site. Startup scheduled for early 1985. Cost, $250 million. Because of its other operations in central Canada, Naranda was able to divert equipment to Hemlo to meet the tight schedule. Once in operation, this mill will process 2,500 tons of ore a day for about 1,000 ounces of gold. The shaft below this rig plunges straight down for one kilometer. The main shaft is the lifeline of every mine. At Hemlo, its five compartments take men down to the rock face by elevator cage and bring back the gold-bearing rock to the surface in two giant skips. The final two compartments carry machinery and air. Down in this subterranean world, many kilometers of tunnels follow the gold-bearing ore as it weaves its way through the earth. This crew is working just above the 1,000-meter mark. At Hemlo, the rock will be blasted out of huge stopes or galleries 100 meters high by 37 wide. Massive chunks of rock fall to the bottom of the stoke and are hauled away to be crushed underground into small pieces about 10 centimeters long. Down here, it is inky black. Many walls are whitewashed to take advantage of any reflected light. 
Tiny helmet lights pick out the rock face as miners drill and blast their way into the ore body. The vast ore body that the Hemlo miners will be working on is like a huge rectangular block, starting at the surface, then dipping away toward the north at an angle of 60 degrees. As the miners go deeper, they intersect the ore body by moving their tunnels further to the north. At the surface, the rock is crushed again into still smaller pieces, then processed to extract the gold to about 85% pure. At Hemlo, the Naranda crushing plant will process 2,400 tons of rock a day. Gold poured at the mine is then sent to the Federal Mint to be refined to a purity of 99.9999. Four nines, the purest gold there is. The early Hemlo story got little national press in Canada, and much of what it did get was critical. The Toronto-based Northern Miner is probably the most respected mining paper in North America, and even it was skeptical. Editor Morris Brown explains. Well, we wrote an editorial. <laughs> I think it read the heading was too far too fast for Corona. Uh, stock had gone to uh, from about two dollars to twenty dollars in in just a matter of weeks and uh, to be honest we didn't see any any uh, press releases or there was no contact uh, and uh, so <laughs> we were skeptical eh? and uh, also uh, we knew a little bit about uh, uh, the history of uh, there had been a lot of work done there and you've heard that the tech was in and dropped it twice and things like that so we were skeptical and uh, but on that editorial before, before the ink was dry it hadn't even the paper wasn't even out in the west and there were lawyers and injunctions and <laughs> trouble <laughs> trouble but that old part it passed quickly uh, we were wrong. Uh, they had, the company had filed uh, uh, reports with the uh, Vancouver Stock Exchange as they were required, but we hadn't seen them and they weren't, uh, they weren't uh, issued to the public as far as we knew, so we just didn't know. But we found out. <laughs> it is January 13th, 1983 edition. The Northern Miner headlined the Hemlo Gold Rush and its $2 billion worth. A year later, on January 19th, 1984, that worth had increased to 12 billion, and its editorial claimed Canada's industry was rewriting the book on gold mining. It's, it's a Vancouver Stock Exchange that made this thing possible, and they're they're the ones behind the uh, behind this this big boom when uh, 200 companies and 50,000 that wasn't uh, raised down here at all. But I think they're uh, just feeling a little bit. Uh, <laughs> down on Bay Street, they're just a little bit envious and uh, there is a, there is a, a change coming. Canadian stock exchanges have established a unique life cycle. Montreal dominated the market for years, only to be toppled by a rambunctious Toronto, offering more speculative opportunities as well as blue chip stock. Mining stocks found a good home in Toronto. Bay Street became one of the most important mining financial centers of the world, still is. But Toronto soured on the high-risk mining community in the mid-60s over the Windfall Affair. Windfall was a small Ontario mining company. In 1964, two of its directors were charged with dubious practices of manipulating stock prices by releasing misleading information. As a result, Ontario authorities came down severely on the junior companies and the action moved to Vancouver. The Vancouver Stock Exchange is 76 years old and the unchallenged risk capital capital of Canada, perhaps the world. It is dedicated to risk and although many people find that disturbing, it's impossible to disregard its phenomenal success in the past two years. 
much due to Hemlo and gold generally. The odds of a prospect becoming a commercial mine are no better than one in a thousand. So mining needs risk capital and plenty of it. Hemlo would not have become the remarkable gold camp it is without risk money from Pezin. Peter Brown. The, the Vancouver Stock Exchange in the early, late 60s, early 70s was the only exchange that, together with its commission and government, that decided that, uh, that they could accommodate this business, that they could develop a regular f regulatory framework successfully that would allow this business to flourish while, while other jurisdictions had in fact eliminated it. And uh, uh, that they could, there was a determination to build the venture capital marketplace. Claude Bonhomme is a promoter. With resource lawyers like Shirelli, he goes to the stock exchanges for share capital. Bonham explains the dilemma that has hindered Toronto since the windfall scandal. Uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange has uh, started to change the, the regulation to help the uh, small resource-based companies. And we hope that the uh, Securities Commission will also follow and uh, look at it more carefully. We agree that there has to be laws regulating a certain amount of, uh, of, of uh, um, activity on the market. We don't object to that. What we do object is they come in and regulate it to such an extent that they, they actually choke it to death. By the way, they didn't even want to be in it. There was pressure from their government because of the, they were missing the hemlows uh, that got them to agree to reopen it. But it wasn't the prevailing view of the Toronto members that they wanted to open the junior exchange. It was under pressure from their own government. And so they don't even have the desire. Many promoters, particularly Pezin, believe the rules of the game are changing. To regain a competitive edge in world trade, he says the high risk takers, the junior companies he represents so well, must take a greater initiative. A lot of the major mining companies, they better get with it or they're going to be drifting off into oblivion. I mean, you recall once International Nickel was uh, supposedly a giant. Look at a terrible commission there right now. Uh, that's happening to all the major mining companies, uh, unless they start thinking differently, become imaginative in, the, in their financial efforts. Uh, uh, their future problem looks very dull indeed. So they haven't got the exploration dollars available. And uh, they've come to realize that uh, their shareholders have want dividends. You know, that's the only thing that keeps them where they are today. So consequently, they've got to go to the junior companies that can, uh, through our efforts, raise uh, that risk capital to be spent in the form of exploration. The Pez left Toronto in the 60s being called a nickel and dimer, an outright gambler. He returned 20 years later a financier and an unquestioned success. He then surprised many in the industry by striking a unique deal with the giant Noranda Corporation. Bronfman interests have effective control of Noranda. Pezim visits with Noranda President Adam Zimmerman. States anyway, whose thesis was that it cost $290 million to find an ore body, and it uh -huh. takes, uh, that would take us 70 years to do it at our, <laughs> for our, our present rate, so. I wish to have a son like you, Adam. Yeah? Well, <laughs> oh, God. Perhaps you could adopt me. I need the money. <laughs> Well, it's not always the right way, but I don't know, I must say it's a pleasure dealing with that. It really is, and uh, you know, I'm not trying to uh, buddy you up or anything. Okay. Right, well, 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 Adam, I'm glad nice. that you're having lots of lunch there. Oh, sure. and, uh, <laughs> <you> get that. <laughs> Industry watchers will follow the Pezim Noranda deal with keen interest. Does it signal a real trend or just a cute sideways step in an intricate courtship ritual? Well, the deal I'm doing with Noranda, it's their properties, properties that they have located or owned or had their eye on, done the research on. So they've done a lot of work, uh, and we, yes, we will supply the risk capital to further the exploration of it. And then, of course, we're getting a hell of a slice, a, a much bigger piece of the pie, uh, literally 50% of it. Gold is unique among metals, not just because of its physical properties, because it represents new wealth. Much new gold is used for jewelry and by industry, particularly high-tech space and computers. 
But most new gold, once refined and poured into bricks, is hoarded by governments and banks, locked away in their vaults to be used as support for currency. Paper money has no real value, unless it can be supported by other means in global money markets. Trade is one obvious mechanism, but gold remains by far the single most acceptable equity worldwide. Gold is a commodity also with an established worth anywhere in the world. Gold is being traded almost every hour of the day, from Hong Kong and Tokyo to Paris and London to Chicago, Toronto and Vancouver. The city of London has long been a major money market. Its most prestigious merchant banker is Rothschild. Twice a day, a group of bankers meets in this room to fix the price of gold. It is a room resplendent in banking history, with dynasty founder Mayor Amschel looking on. In recent years, there have been attempts to reduce the reliance on gold as a currency support. Monetary Rothschild director yes, Robert Guy. Um, ten years or so ago, there were question marks about gold as a uh, monetary reserve. Uh, and many people were trying to phase uh, gold out, they were trying to demonetize it. The Americans in particular were trying to do that, uh, they were selling gold, the IMF was, was selling gold. But we then passed over that stage, and we then began to see quite a number of central banks, as it were, buying gold um, to increase their, their reserves. And uh, really the situation has changed quite a bit in the last few years, and one's now in the position where many central banks and many major central banks have 50% of their, gold, of their total reserves actually in gold. The use of gold to back major currencies is a relatively new twist. In London's West End, international gold bullion and coin expert Peter Clayton explains why. That you take the entire output of gold of the ancient world up to 500 years ago, it would merely fill two London transport buses. Because, you see, it's a question of reuse. Your gold ring on your finger, my gold ring on my finger, that's 18th century English, the gold setting, although the intaglio is Roman. That's been used somewhere else centuries before. I mean, it could have been Cleopatra's wedding ring, if you like, something like that. Mm. Gold is always being refined, reused. It's only in recent years that one's concerned with so much more coming out of the ground. This is important for major gold producers. Is Canada a significant producer in world terms? Yes, indeed it is, and, and, has be, and, and is becoming uh, more so, um, at least in what one would have to call, uh, with due respect, as it were, the second tier of gold producers. Uh, because, after all, uh, you, you have a position in the market where the South Africans and the Russians are much, much bigger producers. And uh, as you know, I mean, the South Africans produce, say, 650 tons a year. The Russians were never too sure about, but most people think it's probably around about 350 to 400 tons a year. So there's then a big gap between them and, as it were, the major second tier uh, producers. And of those, um, certainly Canada is most significant. Canada produces about 70 tons a year. gold story has many players. It was the persistence of a prospector, the audacity of a promoter, and a radical approach by a geologist that started it all. In turn, they were joined by many others with varying contributions to make. And then, there was luck. So many had trekked over the ground before 1979. So many had come so close to making a discovery. But for any one of a million reasons, the pieces didn't fit. Is there perhaps something unique about the men and women in the Hemlo story, some characteristic common to all? John Larch is a prospector in true Canadian tradition. His and McKinnon's names will join a long list. Names such as Keithley and Dietz, Hollinger, Watts and Bannerman and many others. Larch has prospected much of this country. He has risked his life. 
spent lonely nights on the tundra. He has found iron ore and copper and zinc and many other deposits. And of course, gold. Larch understands the bush. He knows that it can be bountiful, but must never be taken for granted. Winter in this Northland can be treacherous and fatal to the unwary. A prospector having found a likely showing will stake the property to establish his claim. A claim is one quarter of a square mile. A young tree makes an ideal post, difficult to destroy or remove. For 23 years, Larch owned the same stripped down Piper Cub, claimed he could put it down as neat as a helicopter, and probably could. Recently, he allowed himself the luxury of a slightly more powerful machine. Larch teamed up with McKinnon once before in the mid-60s during the Texas Gulf rush. Then in 1979 came the chance meeting at Hemlo. It was to be a partnership that neither man would ever forget. From this starting point, fully identified as to location and prospector, the claim must be measured out. First, a quarter mile north is paced off and staked. The same repeated east, then south, then west to the original stake. The post is identified and tagged. Claims are registered at a government office, and if confirmed as free and clear, become the prospectors for a period of one year. During that year, certain work must be done on the claim, after which a 20-year lease is granted with certain conditions. With their claim duly registered, prospectors such as Larch and McKinnon must then take to the road in search of financing. The amounts of money needed and the risks involved make exchanges like Vancouver invaluable. Bay and Granville streets are a far cry from this pristine setting where danger is never far away. I took off my snowshoes and when I went to step in the airplane, my feet went through. Apparently the uh, current had eaten the ice out that was just a crust of snow there. So as I w w went down into, into the rapids, I caught the ski of the airplane. And uh, it's sort of an awkward feeling to be looking at the airplane above you and wondering when the plane is going to come through. But uh, luckily, it, uh, it held, and I managed to get out by putting my snowshoes on the snow and just sort of crawling out slowly. And uh, it's happened often that uh, I've been under the ice in the wintertime or gotten, gotten wet. This just makes the business more interesting. You never know what's going to come up next. from the accolades at a charity roast in Vancouver to the beginnings for Murray Pezim. He grew up in the 30s in a Jewish ghetto off Toronto's Spadina Avenue. His father was wiped out in the 29 crash. The family ran a butcher's shop when hamburger was 10 cents a pound and butter 9 cents. Pez made the deliveries on a bicycle. It was tough being a Jew in those days, you know. Uh, my nose, yeah, I used to get beat up every day. <laughs> I know it's survival, it's just one big mass now, but uh, if one wanted to stay out of fight, you'd have to walk for about eight miles to get to school, you know. But uh, they used to wait for us, you know, and, uh, but we fought our way through. We used to go with the gang of us and kick over a fruit set and then grab apples and run like hell, you know, oranges. You didn't, you didn't have little food. You literally had to steal your food. You know, 
I should know. This is it, Doug. <laughs> My childhood revisited. <laughs> I have been here for maybe 20 odd years, but I do remember it. Right, you have to turn in here if you want to. Uh, uh, this was a butcher shop right at this corner. I lived right next door to it. I don't even know if the house is still there. Uh, by God, I don't believe this, but the house is still there. Uh, in behind there. That's actually the structure right there, just behind this fruit stand. Can you see that red peak roof? Yeah. That was it? <laughs> Where was your room? Well, I was uh, upstairs, at, uh, right in the front there. It really hasn't changed that much. <laughs> Amazing. You could go out here and you could buy a corn beautiful corned beef sandwich, you know, in those days, with two for a nickel. <laughs> <In the deli. laughs> That was the big treat every Sunday, was to get about a dime to get a couple of sandwiches and a bottle of Coke or something, you know. That was your big night out. It was great. <laughs> Getting a little blood back from the past. <laughs> the Jack Isles. <laughs> well, it was a few minutes late. Last time... When people come to British Columbia, they ask me about two people, usually Pezum and Scalvania. The Pez, the one and only. And uh, while they deal in completely different products, they're very similar. They're totally committed to the game, to wheeling and dealing, to financing. And uh, they'd rather write a bad deal than no deal. I mean, they're, Pesham, uh, if he thinks the market's going to be active the next day, he's at downtown at 4 o'clock in the morning waiting three hours for it to open. Uh, so in, uh, commitment and enthusiasm. He's, uh, addiction, uh, maybe, is better than commitment. He's addicted to the game. Danny, accept the way it is. <laughs> I can't. John, Jewish boy from Vancouver. What are you going to do about it? You know. A young, a young nouveau riche Jewish boy. Stick that nouveau riche up. Pezim is a journalist's dream. He is controversial, to say the least. He is also a formidable opponent for the interviewer who chooses confrontation. I'm great. Let's watch this promoter. I'm sure how to whip up a whole country. The whole country? Yeah. I'll whip up. Pezim sets himself a shattering pace of 16-hour days. He spends a lot of that time hustling his friends for charity. Sure. Might do better than that. I'll go to into each town. I got Safeway working with me. This is Pezim's world. Everybody Celebrity status and always promotion. Especially Even his detractors call him Mr. Hemlo. I picture Longsworth a buck for Christ. Watch it happen. There's, there's no one greater. You know that. It, I know that. You know, finally should say the guy, he is the greatest. We, you know, we got to admit it and let him stop talking about it. That's all. I like your column. In another place and time is the world of Don McKinnon. On the road alone, he listens to masterpiece readings on cassette. Like Larch, he spent much time defying the elements, pursuing the big find that is the next one. He found plenty of ore, but never wealth. I've been in the business for 25 years and I've uh, never really made any, this is the first thing that's going to amount to any, or what you could say, any type of money at all. And I've been living on my wits for all that time and the, during that period of time with the projects uh, I've come up with and uh, we've generated so much work and never made any money and have no, uh, no uh, assurance that we're going to eat tomorrow. One of McKinnon's sons is set to follow him. My one son, he's been out for two years and he, he loves it. He's worked with Walter Baker and he, he's worked with uh, another old timer, Art Wright. And they, at first he figured he wouldn't like it at all. Now he's getting to, to like it very much. You have to know a lot about the bush. You can't learn it in, uh, like I say, he's been two years already. Of course, he thinks he knows a lot, but he's, he's learning a lot. 
And he's got a lot to learn yet, too. McKinnon's respect for the environment is obvious. He and his family live on a farm north of Timmins, in the heart of the countryside that he has prospected for so long. It is a part of Canada that has produced many famous mines. Noranda, International Nickel, Val d'Or, Detour, Texas Gulf, Kirkland Lake, and others, producing almost every metal used by modern society. Here is breathtaking natural beauty and peace. McKinnon relishes it. I think we're going for a walk, eh? Prospecting has taken him yeah, far from home, too. Worried. He has worked all the major regions of Canada, parts of the United States and Mexico. Even now, with the success of Hemlo, he chooses not to slow the pace. I, I see people, I know so many friends of mine who just detest going to work. Can you imagine going through life like that? I, I, I've always, I will never do something I don't like doing. And I've always done what I like doing, the forestry industry and the mining. And that's, uh, that's my life, and I always will. You'll never catch me. I had a big job when I was with Kimberly Clark. I guess, I, in fact, the president told me you'd be the last guy who'll ever go anywhere without a degree. But it was in the office. When the spring came and the water started running down the windows, no, 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 I said, I'm going outside. That's it. Like Pezim, McKinnon treats work as a pleasure. He sees no real labor in what he does, even though it's rigorous and often dangerous. Oh, yeah, he claims indifference to his wife's horses, but talks to them like a doting father. In the bush, he walks at a relentless pace, and perhaps that's a key to his personality. Perseverance. For 15 years, he harbored the dream of Hemlo. For 15 years, he slowly gathered information, and bit by bit, put the pieces of the puzzle together. He admits that Walter Baker's words were never far from his thoughts. He gives Lady Luck her due also. He is very outspoken on individuals' rights. His life has demanded self-reliance, and perhaps that, more than anything else, he sees as a supreme virtue. He has known his share of danger and faced it. Oh, there's a lot of, a lot of situations in the Arctic, you know, uh, so many times we've crash landed and been four days on the lake, uh, no food, and uh, the pilot scared the uh, fog coming in and cold and oh, my, 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 my. But it's all part of the game. Part of the game it may be, but that resignation to the inevitable is a trait shared equally by a large peasant and McKinnon. Hemlo is the beginning of what some claim to be a new era for gold mining in Canada. In this winter of 83 and 84, there is still a year to go before some 30 kilograms of gold will be poured into the first brick at Naranda's mill. It's more than a billion years since nature laid down her treasure at Hemlo. It's just a hundred since men began digging for it. In 1869, an Indian named Pekong Gay discovered gold near Heron Bay, 32 kilometers west of Hemlo. J.K. Williams, the Ontario doctor who had moved to the United States, patented his 11 claims in 1945. Many claims have been registered around Hemlo, but always they lapsed. Either there wasn't enough ore, or more often, the price of gold was too low. In 1979, McKinnon made his move and staked the first 12 claims on Corona. That led to the present estimate of 100 million tons of gold-bearing ore. And the way it looks to me, I've seen a little bit of the stuff. There's no reason why there wouldn't be 250 million tons, because it doesn't look as if it's going to be cut off. It's still going. They're still drilling. What makes Hemlo so interesting is that the geology is similar over much of this area. Hemlo could be just the first of a number of gold deposits to be discovered. Hemlo gold will leave the mill for less than $150 US an ounce. The more the price of gold rises, the more intently the world will focus in on the place called Hemlo. You must keep going. The easiest thing to do in, in life is to quit. Anyone can quit. Anyone. But no matter how high the mountain, never quit. That's the whole, just keep driving on. Just keep driving on, because you never know, boy, around that next bend, uh, something's waiting in there. I've, I've known many people that have been stubborn about carrying on and have come out on top, you know. 
I've plotted three years and suddenly bang. The only problem in life, usually this doesn't happen to you until you're too old to really enjoy it. <laughs> that deal, and I'm going to find a couple more hemlows uh, before I'm finished. I mean, if, if, I, if I said I wasn't, I mean, I, I'd uh, sit back and just... Uh, uh, warp away. I, I'm active and I'm going to stay active for a long time. Oh, sh I reached the top of the mountains uh, I've been climbing, but I'm looking at a bigger one. I always look at a bigger one. Uh, God, I'd die if I couldn't see a bigger mountain up there. <laughs> See you.